Next up will be uh, will be a talk by uh, Bruce Kale Ka Kale. That was it. Kale. Sorry. <laughs> um, Brewster is a digital librarian and he is the founder of the Internet Archive. I'm sure many of you will know that. <laughs> Brewster has been uh, working on, on Internet technology since the mid 80s and now he's here to call upon us to make it better. Brewster, please. Thank you. Working? Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, so this, is, this talk uh, is speculative. Um, tomorrow morning at 10.30, if anybody's actually awake, uh, we're going to talk about how we're hacking copyright to try to get everything online. But this talk is really um, dedicated and motivated by Edward Snowden. Um, that we basically... <laughs> we, We've come a long way, but we've been showing that we've got some real faults. Um, for the last 25 years, we've been pouring an amazing amount of effort and great stuff and our personal lives into the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web has flowered into something completely amazing, um, but we've got some problems, some real flaws. And this talk is to try to uh, see if we can help address uh, some of these. Um, my friend and hero, Larry Lessig, said, code is law. That how we code the web determines a lot of how we live our lives online. That if it's not in the code, it probably doesn't exist within how it's working. So we should have freedom of speech embedded in the code. We should have universal access to knowledge embedded in the code. We should have privacy both writer privacy and reader privacy embedded in the code. But it turns out that it's not there. The actual the web is fragile. It's kind of broken, even. Um, but it is huge. We know this at the Internet Archive because we collect about a billion web pages every week. We're basically snarfing up and starting to really understand what it is the World Wide Web is. And every web page the average life of a web page is about 100 days between when it's either changed or it's deleted. So there are these pages that are flickering on and off websites at a constant pace. So it's not a, a very reliable infrastructure to use. But it is massively available. You can get to all, almost everybody, well, except if you live in China. Um, so the Internet Archive is blocked in China. Um, it's, uh, we're on and off blocked in Russia. Every so often we blink off in, in India based on government mandates. So the web is not reliable in terms of the web pages or in terms of how you can get uh, things out, out to people. So we've got some problems there. Um, we also have a problem that it's, it's not private, um, that corporations and governments are watching what it is you're reading. And they are up a storm. So Edward Snowden, one of his uh, parts of his releases, showed that GCHQ was watching the people that were using the WikiLeaks website, and then took those people and then gave them to the NSA. And that was enough to, for them to generate special targeting, even if they're American citizens, to basically target the people that have read uh, WikiLeaks. The idea of being rounded up and profiled and uh, targeted based on what you've read is for librarians sort of a major warning flag. There's a long and bad history about doing this, and it's happening now. And it's happening because our technology isn't, isn't good enough. But it is fun. Well, we, we, out of the big three, I'd say, reliable, private and fun. The web is fun. And why is it fun? It's because bonzo people, us, can go and do all sorts of things with it. And we've sort of added to it and manipulated it and made it sort of something pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So I'd say those are the, if I were to have the big three priorities for a next generation web, what I'd want is reliable, private, and still fun. How are we going to get there if we've only got one out of three? I'm, I'm going to suggest, and this is a call, this is a, uh, an aspirational talk, and I think we, within the four 
boundaries of this camp. We have everything required to be able to pull this off. But I think we need to start thinking about building a distributed web, a distributed web that would have these three characteristics. And I'm going to try to say a little bit of wow, what this might look like and some of the pieces that might be able to be put together to show a straw man of how this could work. Not that it's the right way to do it, but that it's at least possible. And then I'm hoping that we come together with this as a goal. Let's talk about what distributed means. Um, so distributed, uh, let's contrast the World Wide Web to the internet. The internet is a distributed system in the sense that if any particular piece of hardware goes down or slows down or bogs down, gets overloaded, things route around it. So it's, uh, you basically continue to have the whole thing working even if it gets, parts of it gets nuked, quite literally. Um, the web, on the other hand, is not, decentral, is not de uh, distributed in that way um, because if you basically control the wires to a particular piece of hardware or a particular piece of hardware, you can either watch, control, um, or destroy any particular piece of the internet. Um, take another example. Um, I'd say Amazon dot com's cloud is an interesting one. It that's runs out of a set of data centers all around the world, all owned by Amazon.com. And if you configure your thing right, they'll move your data closer to where your users are, and it'll move it around hardware that's not working anymore. So can we go and build a World Wide Web or internet that works kind of like the Amazon cloud does, but spread all over the internet and not controlled by a single corporation? Another piece is, let's build in the user, um, the reader privacy. So how can we go and make it so that if you are operating on a distributed web, if your website doesn't exist anywhere in particular, then it's much harder to figure out who are the readers of a particular website. So if a website is distributed, multiple copies, multiple places, so that as readers are using them, they're using local copies or ones maybe just down the hall or something like that, it makes it much harder. It's still probably possible, but it makes it much, much harder to go and make a, uh, a big surveillance system that we call the World Wide Web at the moment. Let's also build in a time axis so that there's a versioning, kind of, kind of like Git or something like that for web so that you can always reference older versions of websites so that also they can be forked. So the idea of websites, let's build in the archiving function at the start. The Wayback Machine, which is fairly w widely used, is still not bundled into the web itself. Let's go and make it so that the web is self-archiving as it's distributed so that there are versions of websites uh, that are moving along. And as we're at it, if we're going to build a new web, let's see if we can get some people paid other than Google. So the idea of a, our advertising-driven industry, it, we know how this story ends. It's how magazines, uh, television, or, or radio, it's usually massive centralization of people that build the critical mass ad networks. Let's not do that. Is there a mechanism for us to make it so that we can go and pay for, optionally, either if it's a tip or demand by the, uh, uh, by the writers to be able to make a better web. I'm going to suggest this is doable to be able to make this web happen. How? Well, we've got some tools that Tim Berners-Lee didn't have 25 years ago. JavaScript is actually now an amazingly powerful, very weird, but amazingly powerful programming paradigm that allows code to move around and to be able to, uh, to, to work. We've got the blockchain that's building a distributed database that's at least strong enough to uh, withstand a lot of people trying to get rich by ripping each other off. And there's Bitcoin, which can be used for a uh, micropayments system that could be embedded in a distributed way into the system in, in the first place. And may, let's just remember that 25 years ago, it was illegal to distribute a strong crypto system. We've won that war. But why, let's use it some more. Let's use crypto in, in embedding it and building the next web in some possible ways like it. Now, there's a lot of systems that are, are already kind of going. I'm not trying to say, oh my God, this is the first time I've ever heard of this. No, there is actually a lot of good work that's been going uh, on in these areas and these bits and pieces. So I'm going to try to champion 
bringing things together for a particular end user purpose that then we might be able to rally behind and, and uh, get something uh, seriously done. So these are the systems that uh, uh, I've come across and now more of them I'm finding all the time. But it's people that are building these innately distributed systems. And distributed systems are more difficult to build than centralized systems because you have to think through a lot more protocol aspects and the like. So these guys are some real heroes. And actually, I think most of these programs, these projects, have people here at camp. Um, so what about a bold goal? What can we do that would be a demonstrable, bold, goal, bold enough goal that would make it so that people would want to use a new system uh, and, and the like? What could we do if we could build a WordPress type functionality? So take the, the functionality that people get with a WordPress blog, and, but make it distributed. So it makes it reliable, makes it private, still makes it fun, makes it able to be distributed uh, freely. So what would it take to be able to pull something like this uh, off? What I would say is that we need a couple of components. Um, one is it should work with no plugins. It shouldn't require a new download. It should just run on the existing web. So if you're you know, playing along and you just happen to go to somebody's website, say my blog, and it happens to be distributed, a distributed website, it may take a little while to sort of start up because it's got some more JavaScript and mechanism to it, um, but it would be able to come up and run in, in the browser. So I'd say that's a, a, an interesting characteristic. Uh, it needs to have easy to know names. This idea of knowing somebody's uh, Bitcoin address and thinking you're actually going to remember it. I mean, I can't even remember a phone number. So it has to go have a good naming, uh, a naming system. It has to be fast. Has to, no matter where you are in, in the world, um, it has to be able to be fun to basically go and pound out and, and comment and update. Um, there has to be different user roles. So we need a distributed identity system that would make it so that you could have administrators and editors, you know, all the different things. So I've been using this as that sort of engineering straw man of, okay, what if we could do a WordPress this way, I think we're not a far step away from making a Twitter, a Facebook, a Wikipedia and the like. But, um, but WordPress is at least constrained enough to be able to do this. So what if we take these other couple steps? Can we make it have payments so you can at least have tips? And wouldn't it be great if we actually had a system that you could publish things on the web and get paid for it um, if it's worthy of being paid for? That would be terrific. I think that Apple did a great service by showing us that people will work infinitely hard to make Apple apps for their phones in the promise that you might make money. I, I can't imagine very many app developers actually make much money, um, but they had this mechanism of making it possible to do it. Can we build our next web to be able to survive that? And then can we build in versionings and the archive? I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to go down each one of these, and I'm going to give sort of a, a hand wave of, okay, can we go and do each one of these particular pieces um, with things that are going on? My mind was blown by seeing in JavaScript when they cross-compiled an Apple II computer emulator from C into JavaScript and I could click and run old-style games in my browser. It was just, I, I, I don't know quite why it surprised me so much that you could take a 20-year-old computer, whether it's Macintosh or um, IBM PC, and run it at speed in JavaScript, but it meant that something has changed for me, that we could actually implement most of the server capabilities that we're using in our websites in the browsers themselves. Not only could we do that, we could do the whole peer-to-peer -peer levels of going and sharing and moving the data around in JavaScript uh, itself. Um, oh, and I actually, there's Marcel, uh, uh, who's, who's uh, at Food Hacking Camp. He, he, he basically took my blog and moved it into a peer-to-peer -peer system. So I'm going to do what you should never do a chaos, or any, I'm going to try to do a live demo. All right. So, okay, if this works, you have to applaud. If not, um, then don't say anything and you just sort of say, yeah, oh, you shouldn't have tried that. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so this is my normal Firefox. 
And okay, here it goes. Ta-da! Okay. All right. What this is, is um, my blog running in a peer-to-peer -peer file system called IPFS. Um, and it's running by asking my own machine, and it's calling out around the net and going and pulling in the pieces uh, to be able to put together the files that are my blog. And the cool thing for me about this is it's not just web pages, because you say, hey, well, why, why don't you just put it all in a torrent, um, which it more or less is. Um, but we also have this extra cool thing that um, it's got a search engine built in on the client side. So you say, well, that's kind of neat that the idea of you can take a search engine or database features and be able to then um, be able to, oh, 404 document not found. Yeah, that's a good sign. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, okay, here's where the demo is falling down here. Uh, yay, okay, so basically I'm able to search for Stallman and find um, other blog post. So what, I, what uh, Marcel did is he took my blog and he took the database functions in the search engine, made it into JavaScript, so it's moved around as files. It's now in my browser and I'm sort of having a WordPress-like experience even though it's in my browser. And he sort of said, well, you know, gosh, that's, all, that's easy to do, but if you take that step further, you can really build whole websites applications and move them around pretty efficiently, as best we can tell, um, in terms of, of, of uh, using the peer-to-peer -peer technology to avoid needing a, uh, a server infrastructure. We need an easy naming system for this. So you can just type in, say, Brewster's blog or something like that, um, and have that work. And there are a couple of systems that are starting to work on this using some of the distributed registration systems in the blockchain. For instance, uh, Namecoin has explicitly been doing this using the blockchain uh, underneath Bitcoin, and Ethereum has uh, been using, uh, is build, building a new uh, block blockchain to be able to support other types of contracts. So the idea of having a registration system that doesn't have the problems of the current uh, uh, registration system, which might be a first, first come, first serve style naming or other types of, of naming structures, um, is completely doable as if we use the blockchain type structures. We really want performance and we want versions. And here's something that I think that things like the Internet Archive and other organizations like us can play a role by playing big honking caching servers. If you think of the Wayback Machine, we've got, oh, I don't know, a total of the Internet Archive, we've got about 25 petabytes of data spinning and we, we put out a lot of, uh, of materials and we've got some replications around the world. Um, the idea of making that such that it could be the actual websites themselves, not just snapshots of the websites, I think we could get to, be caught, to catch on. Not, with, not just cultural institutions, but ISPs. Because ISPs want to make sure that their users have a really snappy environment to be able to be served. So if we can make it so that other people can cache things, then it's not just relying on other people's PCs that have read that website recently. Because if we don't have that, then we, we do have just a peer-to-peer -peer system. And at least my use of BitTorrent just means it's slow come, you know, starting up. So we really need snappy performance and having these large caching organizations, I think is completely, uh, completely doable. Another couple check marks here, Up, updates and distribution. So one of the problems with WordPress, uh, excuse me, with, um, with BitTorrent, and actually we've been working with BitTorrent Incorporated on this in their Maelstrom uh, system, is updates are a little bit clunky and weird. Um, that basically it's around hashes where everything has to be uh, unique and it has to be exactly the way it was. Um, but can you build another layer on top of it in such a way that you can have, okay, that's not the, um, the current one. We, we have got a new one. Uh, so use the new version of the blog unless you want the old one. Um, and both uh, BitTorrent has the, their mutable torrents and IPFS has a partly working system uh, for doing this naming. So I'd say that's, that's kind of a hand wave check mark that we're doing pretty well on that particular point. So as I said, I'm just going down this list trying to say it's doable to go and build a completely serverless web infrastructure. 
Okay, here's a, a cool idea, I think. One is to have a distributed identity system that actually uses Bitcoin addresses as your identities. So uh, with strong crypto, we can do now uh, distributed identities. Um, we haven't done it very well yet because mostly uh, you know, we use our Facebook or our Google IDs on all sorts of things all over the net, and that's got its own problems. Um, so if, is there a mechanism for us to use the blockchain and Bitcoin to be able to pull this off? I think so, because it's got a very active community to try to support it, but they've got another extra feature. If we actually use an address as our online identity, then you know how to tip somebody. So if every web page is signed with a Bitcoin address, then you'd actually know how to pay somebody money for what it is that's going on there. And I'm hand-waving, but I believe we could also make it so that people could stipulate that you have to pay something to be able to get something to unencrypt, say a movie, that you'd be able to buy uh, over the net in a distributed way without ever knowing who it is you're, you're paying. So I would say through this that we have the possibility that we have all the pieces, they're not woven together, to be able to build a WordPress-like content management system, which according to WordPress.com is about 25% of all the websites out there, maybe not the most popular, but, of, but there's lot, millions and millions of them. If we can build something with that level of functionality to it, and plug-in ability and distributability, um, that's completely distributed, that has all of these characteristics, then I think we've done something pretty uh, amazing. The idea is to have a web this time around that is reliable, no matter where you are, who you are, um, if, if it's gone away or not, or if the server is, going, is up or down or blocked, that it's private for both the readers of the, the website, which is extremely difficult to pull off, but also the writers. So the idea that you can go and publish anonymously, but you can also read without being spied on or make that much harder, and still make it really fun and malleable enough so that millions of people will go and play with it. That if we make our websites basically apps that move around, we could version our underlying infrastructure more easily than we, we currently have to wait for the browser manufacturers to go and, and put in new features. If, if a lot of the features are in the JavaScript layers that are moved around, we could have a lot more fun in the whole thing sort of evolving in a really fast and interesting way. So concluding, locking the web open. I think it could be something we can do. It's something I suggest we have to do. We can bake the uh, freedom of the press into the code itself. If we do this right, we can make the web openness irrevocable. That we could make it so you couldn't take it back away from us. That we'd basically be locking the web open, building a distributed web. I think we can build this. I think we have the right community to do this. And based on Edward Snowden's uh, revelations, we should do this. Thank you very much. Okay, very interesting talk. Um, we have some time for question and answers. So um, there's mics left and right. If anybody has questions, please form a row. We'll start with the mic here on the left. I think there's someone there. Yes, please. Okay, um, it's a pity that I can't see the speaker from this position. Uh, and he can't see me. Well, maybe we can move there, then we can at least see each other. No? Um, so I, I think it's a really great idea. But um, the problem I have is this sounds like Web 1.0. Um, because if I look at my day job, all of the data I use and care about come from databases, Hadoop systems, and, and whatnot. And there's no more, nobody can replicate it except we can. So um, I think that for, for a lot of, say, political documents and stuff like that, it, it sounds like a really good idea. But for a lot of practical stuff, like, well, how do you do Facebook or Amazon or whatnot, it sounds like it's, well, not really that easy to solve. Um, does this solve all problems? Uh, no. 
Um, I think it might solve for a particular set of communities that we find a lot of at the Internet Archive. That there are a lot of communities that don't want to be tied to a particular piece of hardware or a particular company or the per original person that started the website. And they've been pouring themselves into some uh, website. There, you know, and who knows what's going to happen to it because they've got sort of an arbitrary person in charge. This sort of makes a more distributed structure um, that can at least support those sorts of communities. So uh, the Internet Archive often plays a role for going and hosting those. Um, is that Web 1.0? I, I guess so. Um, I think if the Web 2.0 is the being, basically being able to interlink into other people's websites, I think that that is up to us to do well in building this thing again. Um, so I don't think we have uh, to lose uh, that um, uh, going forward. Web 2.0, I mean more like um, the um, contact contributed by the users of the website instead of the site owner. So, so everything that has comment sections, uh, web forums, whatever, all user-generated uh, content, which is typically stored in databases and, and is not available as, as, as version files that, that you can put into a distributed uh, file system or whatnot, or a version system. I'm not quite sure I understand, but I think that this system is, uh, like, when we implemented this on top of IPF, IPFS, and when we implement it on top of BitTorrent, you can go and take a, somebody else, the website that you're using, and keep a full copy of it and use it for, you can take it apart, you can use it. So it's not all hidden from you. So it, it actually moves around, that the website is encapsulated as a set of files that moves and is replicated and updated. Is this, I, actually, I, I'm not Let's quite sure. I, I, okay, thank you. Okay, we have on the right hand there, I think we had someone at the speaker. Yes? Is it going to be free software? Of course. Yes. I, 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 think it, I think it has to be. I think it has to be um, something that you're, you're free to build on and, and change and mutate. And, and, uh, and I, I happen to be a big GPL fan, but I don't think it requires being GPL style free. Um, all of the components at these layers. But I think they'll be the ones that are successful. Yes? On the left hand over there, please. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks for your talk. Uh, a lot of us, I think, at the camp have been thinking about pieces of this for a long time. And I was a little surprised, I mean, disclosure, I work on Tor. I was a little bit sad that you didn't include Tor in your presentation because reader privacy is achievable today with free software with the Tor network. And end-to-end -end anonymous communication channels with an address that is as complicated as a Bitcoin key uh, are available so that you can host any TCP service, and that's free software run in a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network right now. But, uh, but you're, 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 you're right. Tor has many things to offer that could be built into something like this, and I'm just not, I don't know enough about how. Um, what I think of is Tor is mostly trying to obscure the routing through the network, and then you're still landing on a single place. Mm -hmm. And I think that we could take for certain types of applications, web applications, a lot of, of websites, most websites, we don't actually have to have it in one place. If we, if we allow things to go and be replicated in many places, I think we get a lot of value um, that uh, we wouldn't necessarily just by going and solving it at the routing level. But even this, this weekend, I, I'm kind of in awe of the people that are here. Um, there are people that are trying to solve this this type of problem at many different levels. Um, and, so, and we need it at every different level because, for instance, this approach doesn't handle telecommunications worth a damn. Um, it doesn't have any of the real-time aspects um, that we need to solve in, in other ways. And it has to be where you're actually landing someplace uh, particular. Let's obscure how it gets there. Well, the, the question that I have is actually not about that. There was more comments. Uh, it's a, a German leftist tradition, I guess, to give a five-minute introduction and then ask a self-answering question. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, effectively, I think you said something in your talk that really shocked me, which is we're going to get to an end state where this is it. You're, we've done it. They can't censor the internet anymore. And I think from a political strategy perspective, that's like declaring suicide. And I wanted to humbly suggest 
that we need to think 20 steps ahead, not to the end of this step, which is one more step. Even though it's a big step and it takes a lot of work, I think that if you are successful in what you were doing, you will have a lot of trouble from very powerful people. And we have to plan for that. It can't be the case that the, what you propose is the end step. I mean, you're, you're going to create an unrevocable, uh, huge history of a lot of things, and there will be powerful people who will want to erase those things, and they will attack those systems, and they'll attack the people that run those systems, and we need to think about how that works and what the internet infrastructure in general looks like in the future, and also what society looks like with these kinds of systems, and we should also talk about that in addition to this. And I just hope that it's not the end state, because um, it no. almost sounds like Trotsky's permanent I, I, revolution theory, but without the part where you acknowledge the ongoing work. No, I, I guess I, 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 I misspoke. Um, no, I think this is just a, a step that we can take now because of the maturity of the technologies and some of the mov motivations we've seen. I'd love to see all sorts of mutated, weird-ass things happening on the internet. I want to see it uh, so that we don't have to wait for these large software vendors to go and do new types of experiences on all sorts of devices. We just have some really interesting tools available to us that 20 years ago we didn't, and now it's time to move at least another step forward. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, I think we have maybe time for one more question. On the right hand, my right hand. Yeah, this, this ties in somewhat to some of the comments there. Uh, so some of what you're saying sounds very familiar, and the reason it sounds very familiar is two, three years ago, I think it was when the Congress was last in Berlin, there was a session held in Seabase, which was all about uh, people trying to do distributed, uh, privacy-preserving ways of doing social networking. All the stuff that people are doing on Twitter and Facebook and so on, but in, in ways that have the kinds of properties that you're talking about here. And uh, I didn't follow a lot of that in detail. There was a follow-up session at the next Congress. There was a mailing list. There was all sorts of projects involved, a couple of which I saw up there. But I want to give you the impression that there was a whole ecosystem of projects that were working yes. in that space and very similar goals, but you're sort of looking at a WordPress set of functionality, which is a pretty limited subset. Yes. So it would be a shame to miss out on the opportunity to do something that covers both use cases. Yes, um, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I'm aware of some of these systems, and I know that I'm not using them. So I, I was like, okay, where did what happened to them? And some of it I, I'm imagining is some of the critical mass problem, that you have to get to a critical mass in some of these social networks. And so by particularly picking a blog or something like that that might have some content that you might want to be able to get to that other people don't want you to get to, um, that that is a small enough piece that could independently exist and start to expand. If we get some of these underlying pieces right of whether it's a distributed file system or some of the distributed naming systems, distributed payment systems, we can weave them together in new and different pieces. Um, I'm quite conscious of the IPv6 problem of just sort of everybody has to seem to move or it doesn't happen. Um, and so I think we should need to pick our, our goals carefully so that incremental wins will be still a win enough to gather next momentum for the next step. Um, but yes, I'd, I'd love to not be using Twitter anymore. Uh, so thank you very much. Okay, large hand. Thank you, Brewster.